Good afternoon, Wanakam. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, it's the uh, first time that uh, I've been able to come for the YAL um, IT event in Jaffna. I participated in a couple of events in uh, Colombo. Uh, and I just want to first take a moment and thank all of the uh, organizers, especially Sainz and his team, for a fantastic uh, job that they, they're doing. Um, and uh, it's, it's very pertinent to the speech I'm about to make because my speech is all about the future. And uh, what I see in front of me is the future of uh, Sri Lanka. It's the future of uh, uh, this country. Uh, it's the future of uh, the North as well in terms of the opportunities that are coming up as well. Um, so let me start off by saying that I wish I was 21 years old. Uh, I'm going to be 44 in two weeks' time, but I wish in my dreams that I was actually 21 years old. Because I feel that uh, people in your age um, and the, the, the time that you're living at this moment is the age of innovation. Um, there's, med there's never been a better time than today to be entrepreneurial and to be innovative as well. The revolution of the digital world through the, I, the uh, since the 80s, um, through computers, etc., have been great. But the revolution that's happened over the mobile phone technologies and the barriers that have been removed for anybody to be competing with organizations globally is really the opportunity for us. Today I saw some uh, companies from the north here really pitching for opportunities overseas in, in Europe and uh, Australia. And that's why I think that it's given us the opportunity to be uh, going direct to consumer and directly uh, to scale any opportunities that we have as well. Um, in, the large, in, in the past, large companies tended to control uh, most of the economy. Um, and large families tended to control most of the wealth. It's still true even in Sri Lanka. And one of the things that I'm determined to do is to see how we can break that uh, and unlock that for the people like you all for the future. Because everybody must have the opportunity to succeed and it shouldn't be based on country's size, it shouldn't be based on uh, individual wealth, it shouldn't be based on family wealth as well. So one of the things that I think that is really an opportunity for you all is the digital age today. If you really look at how long a telephone took to be, uh, to be used by 50 million people, it was 75 years. Um, that's how long it took for 50 million people to get to use a telephone. Facebook took one year to get to the same number. Uh, Pokemon Go took 19 days to get to that same number. That's showing you the rate of change that digital um, technology has, has uh, been able to entrench into the community. Today the disruptive technology is giving you the opportunities uh, and it's giving you the advance uh, in terms of certain areas like robotics, 3D printing, AI, blockchain, IoT, etc. All of that is great, but it's the individuals that have to bring that together that's going to make a difference. So I feel there are few areas that, um, as young leaders, that you should focus on. There are five elements in being innovative, and that's coming from my thesis. Um, one of them is really to look at setting up the, the right uh, structure and organization. Um, in uh, most com companies and countries, uh, they always try to innovate from within uh, um, the same place they started. Innovation is something that is really, you need to look at it very differently. It's 
a startup world. It's it's looking at it entrepreneurially. It's looking at it things like less bureaucratic, um, and hence anything that you start, if you start putting systems and processes in, you're not going to succeed. So you have to be scrappy. And the word I use to my teams all the time is: Are we being scrappy? Are we testing things fast? Because today you might launch something, and within uh, within a period of one year, it's dead. But in the past, if you launch something, you can run the same product or service for 10 years and nobody will bother you. So how are you being scrappy in terms of developing? So you really need to test those hypotheses out pretty fast. It's also to think about um, the features that you're trying to solve. And one of the key things, the second most important thing is understanding the consumer. I think we have in Sri Lanka some of the great engineers. And I'll give you an example. One of my friends uh, from a Fortune 500 company is threw out a challenge and uh, he had thrown it out to uh, MIT. MIT said, okay, I can do this for $100,000, give me six weeks. And he was mentioning this to me and he said, can I take that same challenge and give it to one of the universities here? So we gave the challenge, he said, okay, you guys are one week late, but it's okay, you guys do it. And um, we said, we want three weeks and $10,000. And he was like, are you serious? You can't do something for $10,000. And it was around ag tech. Three weeks later, the Morto University team came out with a solution. It didn't look the prettiest solution, but it had the engineering and it had the output that they wanted. Three weeks after that, MIT came back and said, we need another three weeks and another $100,000 to do the same solution. So what I'm saying is we have the engineering talent uh, in Sri Lanka to be able to build the technology. We may not have the consumer-centric mindset which we need to build. It's the age of the millennials, the age of the Generation Z, and it's about immerse experience. It's about going through the iPhone and trying to use those apps faster. It's about taking care of the social and ecological uh, footprints that you're developing. It's about empowering the user to be able to be in the social media um, and, and being an influencer as well. So trying to understand these instances is very important when you're designing a product because most people design the tech and then they decide who they should sell it to. So spending time early on in understanding who that consumer is, what's the problem you're trying to solve, is going to be critical in your success factor. Because a lot of the times I get pitched at least three to four times a week of some product or a business. And I can tell you a lot of the times the ideas are great. But when I ask what's the problem you're trying to solve, who is the customer and what's the market, it's, people don't have the answer. They say it could be this, it could be that. It's a very wide range, uh, and you need to really bring a narrow telescope in terms of what you want to achieve. And that's why the consumer-centric piece is an important piece of your thesis that's needed for innovation. Um, one of the things that I see is that you have to ask those questions, testing those hypotheses early. And if you ask a thousand people, or whether you ask ten people, generally the answer is the same. So it's not about having 20,000 people surveys, and I got the answer from 20,000 people, and they're all saying this. If ten people are your, um, uh, the number of people that you can get to, and if they give you the right answer, that's good enough. So don't be waiting to look at these large surveys of uh, user base and testing. Just be scrappy, do it with 10, 20, 30 people, whatever you can get a hold of. Find the, the problem you're trying to solve and go for it. Because gone, gone are the days where you can do this 20,000 testing, 30,000 testing. It's not going to work. So go very fast. Second piece of it is prototyping and having the minimum viable product out. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to look the prettiest. I was giving this example of the Morot University for you guys. It doesn't have to look the prettiest. But the functionality, if it can be shown, it's good enough to be able to use uh, as well. The other thing is, uh, in the consumer-centric world, is understanding the business models. Uh, a lot of the times, people forget the platform or the business model they're trying to build. And they try to uh, really come up with uh, the overall 
product and then they start thinking of what's the business model that I'm going to have. And when I talk about business model, I'm talking about if you really look at um, whether it's uh, B2B, B2B2, B2C, B2B2B, um, what is, what's the model you're going on? And is it a, a model where it's subscription? Uh, is it something that you're going to be freemium um, model? Think about all of the things that you need to go on. And one of the biggest failures that I've seen in companies is that everybody comes and pitches and says, the market size is $3 billion, market size is 300 million rupees, whatever it is. Yes, the market size is that. But if you don't do the bottoms up and say, for you, how long is it going to take to get to a 10 million rupee business, 20 million rupees business, that's your world. And it's not about the global market and I want to be 1% of that market. It's about how do you build that up. So building that up along with your business model is going to be critical in the, in the success factor when you try and be innovative as well. The third thing is about really being open innovation. Um, I feel a lot of the times that companies traditionally look uh, and individuals traditionally look to be um, doing everything themselves. Um, the example is, you know, made in Sri Lanka, made in Jaffna is great, but if that thing's already been developed somewhere else, just take it and plug it into your system and use it. Um, an example I will give you on this is really uh, looking at something uh, we, we, in our business, always try to innovate from other industries. So we look for opportunities in the car industry. And we found a technology that's being used in the back of a car, in, uh, back of the boot of a car, uh, which stops the bag from moving in the back of the boot of the car. We brought it in, we used it in a clothing business. But if you sort of narrow yourself and say, okay, I have to build this myself, I have to do this uh, development myself, you're always going to be slower. So always look for opportunities to be able to scale faster by bringing open innovation and finding some uh, of the products off the shelf or partnering with others as well. I think Sri Lanka fails in that particular area because we try and build everything ourselves. In the other element, you have an international uh, panel here today and the wealth of knowledge that people are bringing is absolutely brilliant uh, for Jaffna. Um, and if you really look at how do you re really use that talent, how do you use a global network to find solution, it's quite easy. Most people, I would say eight times out of ten, if you reach them out on LinkedIn and say, look, I'm trying to develop this product, uh, I need some help with this, could you give me some time? I'm telling you, eight times out of ten people will. So if you've got a solution you're trying to, uh, if you've got a problem that you're trying to find a solution for, there is a global uh, network of people around the world that you can really link into. And that's another piece of open innovation. How do you sort of get, be comfortable enough to share your ideas? A lot of the times when people come and say, you need to sign an NDA to really, for me to sh speak to you about this thing, I say, don't tell me about it, probably I've heard it, I don't want to look at it. Don't be scared. It's not about an NDA, it's not about a legal document. It's about really enhancing the product or the, the, the service that you're trying to build from other people's knowledge and making it even better. And I think if you really look at examples of uh, uh, this particular thing, just look at the um, iPhone. Now, iPhone, uh, when it was launched um, in, in the 2000s, uh, they actually went back and said, we are looking for a glass screen. And where did they find the glass screen? They found it from Corning. It was Gorilla Glass that they had used in the 1970s. It's not anything new, but they were able to take that for another industry and use it. Um, so if you really look at uh, opportunities, go back into different industries and see if they have done something similarly uh, and whether you can uh, really uh, piggyback on that. And part of doing that, and it's free uh, to do it even through Google, um, is really searching for patterns that people have filed of searching for and understanding where people have actually filed these patterns, which country, because a lot of them are dormant. And you'll actually find a lot of solutions and individuals that will give you answers to the problem by just doing a patent search. Um, it's free, it's not very expensive, and uh, it gives you a lot of the answers that's missing in your um, opportunity that you're trying to drive. The, the fourth thing is really driving the, the culture. 
Um, I'm a very keen uh, driver of culture. I think people, for me, is 90% of uh, the deal that I would make. And driving the right culture uh, that empowers people, that makes them creative, uh, is really important in, in any discipline that you do. Um, and if you really look at collaboration, that's the real culture that you want to build in any team that you're building. If you have individuals who are very close, who are very individualistic in terms of their thinking, you're never going to get a great team. But you will still need people like that, and you just have to understand how to treat them differently. Um, you know, when you have uh, kids, just having one answer to both kids is not going to be the acceptable to them. You might have to have two different answers to, to uh, both kids. So how do you really treat people differently but also create a cohesive collaborative culture is another key skills that you will have to develop as your teams get larger from one to two to three to ten people in your startups. Uh, don't forget the fourth, uh, the fifth point, don't forget marketing. I think um, if you can't commercialize innovation, there's really no point having a patent covered of ideas, etc. Always look at how you can scale it up fast, how, how you can get it out to the market fast. And if it's 80% there, get it out. If it's 70% there, get it out. It doesn't matter. Uh, the feedback that you'll get will improve it. We sometimes get lost in terms of really looking at um, how to make something better and better and better and when it's the right time for the market. Just get it out because if you penetrate and improve the product um, at any time, that's when you really see uh, user base giving you feedback to improve your product even better. And if you really look at um, an example like this, look at the Concord plane. It was an amazing technology. Uh, it's, it was an unimaginable feat of design. It was supersonic speeds, uh, but financially a disaster. It needed to sell 300 planes to cover the cost of development. It sold 16 planes. So when you really look at something like that, and it now the Concorde sit in museums, uh, you know, if you don't really understand and really develop the marketing piece of it and get things out early, you'll continue to finish something that's never going to get off the ground in the marketplace, whether it's the right price, whether it's the right market, whether it's the right consumer as well. The key Part of that is really doing the consumer work early enough, but also to market to the right uh, people as well. Successful companies are really that uh, are those who really innovate. If you really look at um, uh, the top 10 uh, organizations in 2008, and you look at organizations in 2018, the top three companies were uh, Petrona China, Exxon, and General Electric. Top three companies 10 years later is App, Apple, uh, Alphabet or Google, and Microsoft. And number four is Amazon. So it's flipping completely from really traditional businesses to digital businesses. And if you're going to be successful, you sh should follow companies that are really continuing to disrupt themselves and really look at innovation as an avenue for growth rather than an avenue for survival. And companies that really do it well are things, companies like Procter & Gamble, uh, 3M, who are much more global organization. But if you look at smaller organizations and look what um, Google does uh, and look what Microsoft does, they actually create smaller teams that actually can disrupt within their business the, their whole business itself. So they have these times, uh, where the 20% time, where they allow and allocate to those individuals to really disrupt their own business. So how do you create your teams in the innovation culture to be able to do that as well? Um, one of the key things is understand the trends in your market as well. So if you're in a particular market and you're really looking at um, growing in that particular market, understand the that there is an opportunity. So, I mean, if you look at Blockbuster and, and in the US and how that went out of business, they had the opportunity to buy Netflix. Uh, I think it was like $50 million or something at that time. And they didn't buy it because they didn't think digital was big. But they went out of business. If you look at Kodak and the all the development and R&D they did on digital, and they didn't get into digital cameras, and they lost out. So if you look at companies like this and you look at uh, opportunities that you're developing, um, always think of the pipeline and continue to develop on innovation as well. Uh, so from a national point of view, why does innovation really matter? Why does entrepreneurship really matter to Sri Lanka? 
taking away the current political condition, which I, I don't want to talk about, we uh, constantly compare ourselves to countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia, etc. And I always say those are the wrong countries to compare because one thing, Vietnam, Bangladesh, Indonesia all have more than 100 million people in population. Anything you put out to the market is going to have an opportunity to sell in that particular market. So you can't compare yourself to those countries. We need to compare ourselves to, we've always been compared to Singapore, but I think like countries like Israel or Jamaica. So if you really look at these countries, and I'll just give you some numbers, Israel's GDP per capita is $36,000. Uh, Singapore's is $93,000. Jamaica is $9,000 and Sri Lanka's is $12,000. If you look at the unemployment rate, Israel is 4.3, Singapore is 2.2, Jamaica is 10.4, and Sri Lanka is 4.5. In terms of corruption, Israel is 32nd, Singapore is 6th, Jamaica 68th, and, and Sri Lanka 90, 91. In terms of innovation, Israel is 11, Singapore is 5, Jamaica is 81 and Sri Lanka is 88. And why is it important f to, to understand these numbers? Because we have the opportunity of either becoming an Israel or a Singapore or becoming a Jamaica. And that's the difference that I see in this room and what I saw this morning because you guys can make that difference because we can get to become a Singapore or an Israel uh, and be competing because I've seen the talent that's available in Sri Lanka. And the government, including um, uh, people like us who get involved in sort of influencing some of those uh, policies, need to really follow up, follow things like what Israel has done. And, in, you know, looking at the Innovation Authority, and, and look, they've started this program called Yosma, which gives early stage funding. Um, so we've also been working with the government to try and get that. We started off Hatch Kalam in Jaffna so that people like you can use it uh, as an opportunity to really develop your product, get into the system, and also get funding. We've just, Jeevan and, and myself have just started Hatch in Colombo, which is an incubator uh, as well. Uh, and an accelerator to really give the opportunity for young people like you to come in there, work together. It's not just about finding a workspace, it's not an office. It's about the culture you're trying to create. It's about learning from each other. It's about getting help where you don't uh, have the knowledge. Because when you're starting small, you don't have the skill set and the team or the money to have everything that you need in an organization. So we are setting things like these things up so that you guys can really uh, utilize that and benefit from uh, building uh, strategies uh, for your country. Um, if you really look at the untapped potential of uh, the Sri Lankans here, um, it can really uh, drive forward this economy. We need to move this economy from uh, what we feel is from a uh, buyer-led economy to an export-led economy. And what do I mean by a buyer-led? When people come and give you orders and say, this is what I want to develop, to creating products, which is export-led, creating products and selling it out. We don't create enough product in this country to be able to go out to the world and say, this is a product that's been developed in Sri Lanka. I'm very proud of um, you know, uh, Dilma, I'm very proud of WSO2, I'm very proud of Millennium IT, I'm very proud of Spacelon because they are export-led products. And that's the sort of developments that you guys have to do in terms of developing product or a system or a, a service to be able to drive the economy forward. We need to move really towards a tech-led industry. We have already have a great STEM education in, in our universities. Uh, you can see it. Um, you see the challenges at uh, um, the universities, and you've seen the challenges today. There are really great talent that we have. Um, what we want, need to do is that understand that one job in high-tech sector has a 4.3 multiple in the jobs it can create in the local community and the services as well. So if we take that average and if we can create one tech job, what it means is that we can create a multiple applying effect of 4.3 to our economy as well. 
We also need to be mindful that we may not have all the talent that we need in Sri Lanka to be competitive. We need to have an open mind and, and understand that immigration is a good, great way of bringing talent that's missing in Sri Lanka. We don't have all the talent. And how do we bring people from around the world for the missing core piece of that talent? Because there's no point saying we will only work with Sri Lankans. There's absolutely no need to do that. And how do you bring the talent that's going to give us the missing piece to really develop the products and services that you guys are really working on? This is a great time in this region. Um, Sri Lanka alone is one, but this region is becoming an important piece of the global region. If you look at the center of the Earth's gravity in terms of wealth, the gravity was, a, uh, you know, in the early t uh, 70 years ago, um, the gravity was just over Afghanistan. And what I mean by gravity is if you look at global wealth and where wealth is distributed, wealth was distributed equally and the center was in over Afghanistan 70 years ago. Over a period of time, the wealth has gone towards the west. And today the center of gravity is somewhere around uh, the UK and Germany. But what's interesting is that the center of gravity is predicted to move back towards Asia. And why is that a great opportunity for us? Because in a circle, we have an access to four, four billion people that we can sell to. We have an opportunity within a three hour radius to fly, to um, touch almost two billion of those people. So we are so hell-bent on developing product for the Western world, which is Europe and US. But honestly, the Asian market itself is the biggest opportunity that we have. We don't have to go all the way out there to develop product. So we need to start thinking and saying, okay, you, don't, you want to be the next Facebook. Alibaba didn't think they want to be the next Facebook in US. They said they want to be the next uh, uh, com biggest company um, in uh, China, and they compete in with the Amazon of the world in China. But if we don't start thinking regional, I think we will miss the opportunities, and we're going to give those opportunities to up-and-coming countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Vietnam, uh, where I see a lot of talent. I spend a lot of time traveling. I see a lot of uh, the companies that pitch to me in these countries, and I can see that the talent is coming, uh, or improving every time I go there. So we have the opportunity to really be a market leader in this region uh, as well. The consuming class will, is also increasing. So the middle class, when it moves up uh, and the affordability increases, the opportunity increases as well. And in Asia, that middle class is moving slowly up as well. That means they have more spending power, uh, more um, luxurious goods that they will buy, and more services that they will buy. So we need to really look at um, tapping into that talent as well. If we want to really be an innovative country, an organization, I think we have to have a high sense of curiosity. We need to think that data is the new oil and everything is driven through data because it is and you know we're driving a lot through artificial intelligence and Slascom uh, has organized this artificial intelligence uh, seminar next week which uh, I think we should be very proud of. Um, because data is going to drive our lives. So anything that we're doing, uh, it can't be done. Anything that we're developing, it can't be done. So even from coffee machines to shirts you wear, uh, and we, we ship a lot of these goods as well, um, is IoT driven. So how do we make sure that the products and services we're really developing is for the new world? And using that data, how are we making management and business and customer-centric decisions as well? And we also need to have this mindset that we don't mind if it's not made here. Uh, Pick Me, which is a great company in, in Colombo, didn't think about, okay, you know, it has to be a new cool idea that comes from Sri Lanka. No, they took an existing idea, localized the idea, and, and implemented it. Um, I think that's a great example of where some of these things that you see in the Western world, localize it, bring it in, and, and really develop those products as well. My biggest learning in the last 10 years is give, willing to give time to people. When people reach out to me on LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and say, can, you, can I come and meet you for half an hour? 
a lot of the times I would say yes and uh, meet them. And the reason I do that is I learn a lot more uh, from them as well in terms of what's happening in the market, what the new generation is doing. Be willing to give time to people, whether it's your peers, whether it's your competitor, uh, whether it's someone that uh, is not in your industry, and learn from them. Because I think that's a big learning gap that um, we have, that we don't uh, see the value in speaking to someone and being sharing our ideas as well. So I think there's a real good opportunity for us to be innovative through that as well. Um, and finally, building an ecosystem. And you need to really think about the ecosystem you need around you to be successful. What are the uh, products and, uh, that you're building? What's the ecosystem that you need? So, for example, if you're getting into electronics, you need to understand the battery. What's the ecosystem you're going to need for that? If you're going to get into sensors, what's the ecosystem you're going to need for sensors? Um, so how do you really continue to build ecosystem um, within the organization as well? And I think uh, opening your minds to be able to build that ecosystem uh, is going to be a critical uh, part as well. Innovation can be done anywhere. It doesn't have to be an organization. It can be an NGO. It can be a government. It can be an individual. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, it, one of the greatest innovations that I feel that we've been able to bring to the market is really looking at the, the trail cancer walk, uh, walking from uh, Mathra to Point Pedro when everybody says it can't be done, are you crazy, you get shot. Being against that and really building uh, um, a new way of collecting money and to be able to raise $10 million and build that hospital in Telipale was really in innovative. And it, did, it doesn't have to be just in a business. It can be anywhere uh, that you wish. So my message to all of you is that, one, I still like to be 21 years old. Um, and two, I think the op biggest opportunity uh, in this world remains in this room. And three, go out and burn the boats because you really have that opportunity in this marketplace. It's never uh, been better than this to really be entrepreneurial, really be innovative in whatever we do. Thank you.